Hello everyone. Today we're going to look at Shanna Gardner and Mario Fernandez Saldana's case management hearing in the murder of Jared Brightigan. And today we found out some information, not much information, but a lot of motions being passed back and forth. And I just wanted to do a recap in the beginning what this case management hearing is about. It's about some contested documents and also the motion to, um, from Mario and Shanna's lawyers to disqualify the state attorney's office because of privileged documents. There's two documents in question. Jose Baez and Patrick Cordy want to also have all of the charges dropped against Shanna, which is highly unlikely. Uh, there's an independent judge, Judge Foster, who is looking at these unredacted, contested documents and emails. Good morning, Patrick Cordy. All right, thank you. Good morning to you all. Uh, we are here for the they have filed a motion for clarification, and this was Rodney. We did, Your Honor, and it occurred to the state, just kind of out of nowhere, that uh, in an effort to save time, it may be appropriate to file this motion because ultimately prejudice has to be part of the equation in deciding how to rule on the defendant's motions. And if the court is not going to know what the prejudice is, I don't see how the court can rule. Judge, what had happened was, the state had always let me explain. The were in receipt and had both of those and had looked at one intended on using it, had looked at the other or had been made apprised of the other, uh, did not intend on using it, uh, but it was in their possession. We learned that in discovery, both of those labeled confidential communications, one had a typo, it was confidential confidential uh, communication, just an extra O. And they were emailed directly from Lindsey Butler to Miss Stifler, um, and there was text messages and communications. Those are part of all of the other emails that they just say they have not seen, but they uploaded to Next Point, and we learned that they had access to really the entire time, even Miss Butler had access to them. Okay. Um, so those are the two that are the uh, the documents, and I'm not sure if this is what you want me to respond to, but. I find this motion ironic that at the last hearing, I suggested to this court, you could, you could do everything to avoid this issue if that's what the state wanted. I even waived any kind of recusal argument that you would see. What we are uh, arguing is confidential communications, attorney-client privilege stuff. And the state didn't want to do it that way then. The court didn't want to do it that way which I was fine with. I understand why the court did it the way you had done it. And I just want to say, you had told us back in December what your plan was, and you have never deviated from that in chambers. From the moment we filed our motion, you said, this is what I'm thinking I'm going to do. You've reiterated that at almost every pretrial. So for the state to come in today and say, just kind of out of nowhere, we thought of this, I, I don't find that to be a credible argument because they've had months to think about the procedure. 
And then at the last court date, you could not have been more crystal clear with us. You said, we have two documents. Do we have an agreement as to how we're going to proceed? I mean, you, you were baiting us to give you alternative suggestions or tell you that we aren't in agreement so we could iron it out. And it could not have been more clear as to what you wanted, what you wanted Judge Foster to do. And even, you may not know this, but when we got to the Judge Foster uh, turnover, is really what I would call it, it wasn't really a hearing, Judge Foster was, we had prepared just the two documents. And we had done blackout copies and regular copies for the court. And the order, Judge Day's order was somewhat unclear as to whether the emails, I think it was the emails that referenced the documents, but the state was like, you should read all the emails. So I ran back to my office, I blacked out all of the emails. Oh, all what emails? All 60 something emails. Because I thought we had agreed on just the two, but Judge Foster is now reviewing all of the confidential communications, all of the emails and the two documents, really which wasn't, I didn't have any objection to that. That's what the state wanted. I figured let's get it over with. Let's move this case forward. But even I thought at that hearing, we kind of got put on short notice as to what the state wanted. But either way, we complied. And then shortly after that, Mr. Mizrahi reached out and said, we want Judge Foster to review everything. And most importantly, and Mr. Crody and I both agree, on, I don't think Judge Foster has jurisdiction to make a ruling in this case. He's not a circuit court. He's, he was appointed as a special master to review documents, not to make decisions in the Fernandez Gardner case. And I think okay, that's well, um, let me let me stop you there. Yes, so from my understanding, I always thought, and I, I'm just sticking with Fernandez, Mr. Crody, just bear with me, okay? Yes, sir. All right. No, no, sir, sir. Did the state believe that I, I thought we were very narrow um, in what Judge Foster was actually going to review. Um, and I thought the state was indicating through your last response, and the reason why I asked him to review just those things is that the state, there wouldn't be any need for Judge Foster to make any type of um, prejudice finding or because the state was saying you did not have access. The state was agreeing that these two documents you have had access to, that you, your alternative view is that it is evidence, it is not attorney-client privilege. So. Correct, but in analyzing both defendants' motions, and then we're trying just to stick with Mr. Fernandez, um, the allegations are not just about those two items that the state well, is, so. Let's well, stick with Fernandez for now. Right. I, I, I've got a different, I've got a different set of questions because when I did the initial order, I didn't have Miss um, Gardner's motion and what was going on, and I'm, I'm maybe. But even at, I'm sorry. Even as to Mr. Fernandez, the allegations are the improper handling of alleged attorney-client privilege, even if unseen by the state of Florida, rises to a level that the court should remove the state of uh, the attorney's office from the case. That's in Fernandez's motion. So uh, the prejudice has to be part of that. And, and I just well, I, that, that docu these documents, these two things labeled, I thought the state of Florida was saying this is evidence. So That's true. Um, the case law is that um, there has to be, if the state inadvertently gets information that is in fact attorney-client privilege. There has to be some type of mitigating scenario by the state of Florida, and that would be essentially the line. That is, the state of Florida didn't try to mitigate anything. So you were saying it's evidence, it's not attorney-client privilege, and the case law seems to flow from, that would be very decisive in what decision would be made. And I, I, I don't know why Judge Foster would need to make that. If you were saying you had access to a full access, and you're saying it's evidence, and Judge Foster says, let's say he rules hypothetically that it is attorney-client privilege, there isn't any need, because the state has already said, I've had it, it was evidence, and the case law is, like, for example, I can't remember the name of the case, but it was like jail calls, where the state had it try to use it as evidence, and they were saying it's a term-type privilege, therefore, disqualification should flip. Okay. Right? 
No, so, I, I, I agree that although the case law may indicate as to those jail calls, I believe in this particular case with this particular fact, prejudice has to be part of it. Because even if these are potentially attorney client privilege, the, the contents of what was looked at are not communications between a lawyer and a client, like a jail call would be. So I, I don't think that just because Judge Foster rules that it's attorney client privilege that the case law applies, I disagree with that. Because the content matters. It matters as to the two documents we saw, but the allegations that the defense has made goes beyond that. It doesn't just talk about the two documents. Why did you ask him to review the 60 emails? Because it's part of the defense motion. They have said that even though the state never saw these things, they should be dismissed from the case because they had access to it and put it on a cloud that other people had access to. But the state's defense always was it never accessed it. Correct. Right. Correct. So why is he reviewing it? If no one accessed it, then, and then Mr. Dreiser is saying that he doesn't want anybody to review it, and that's what he, he made that very clear. Like, and I wasn't under the impression that Judge Foster would be reviewing any of those things. I thought it was just going to be the two. The reason why he's, first of all, he thought he was reviewing it, and he's asked the parties, and the state said, yes, we agree you should be reviewing that. We don't know what's in there. Okay. But it could be, based on their motion saying that we uploaded it to a cloud, the entirety of those conversations could be high on the schedule of meeting. Okay. And then the court can make two findings. One, that the state never had access to it, never saw it. And two, even if they improperly uploaded it to a cloud, it is de minimis and non-prejudicial. So you're able to make rulings on multiple avenues, not just one that we just didn't see it. Because the motion allegations go beyond the seeing of those items. They go to actually even if we didn't see it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. What's your response to Mr. Dreiser's, that he doesn't have jurisdiction to rule on the disqualification motion? Well, I agree. That's why I filed the motion. I think that we need an order to give him that jurisdiction. Okay. Or, I mean, I just, maybe I didn't realize this the first time. The state is fine with the court ruling on the ultimate motion, but you have to review everything. So, I mean, it doesn't matter to us what judge does it, but we think it should be the same judge. This is very, this is very different than like a civil case where you would, a court would normally review the term crime privilege as a problem because a civil court doesn't have any type of sentencing power. I potentially would have a sentencing power in this case. And, you know, that's why. Well, we understand. We understand why, you know, obviously I have no objection to that. It makes perfect sense. If the defense is willing to waive it, I mean, we have no problem with that. All right. But the whole point of the state's motion is that it seems impossible for one court to rule on what the defense has filed without some knowledge, without full knowledge, not even some, full knowledge of what the contents of the communication is for. Mr. Dreiser, do you have anything else to add? I would like to add that this is just yet another example of the state of Florida not following the procedures that are set forth either by agreement or court order in this case. This whole entire issue stems from an agreement that the state and I made at a pretrial hearing before my client was even arrested to make sure that our attorney-client privilege information would not be looked at. And then it got looked at. And access— I'm going to check this right now. I mean, we're—this is not about the merits of the particular item. I'm not going to do that. I'm not checking. Well, I just—maybe I'm trying to get down to what will—I don't want to stay this case any longer than I have to. I 
I want to get down to really the heart of what the dispute is so that we can move this case forward. And I, I really, I tried very, very, very hard uh, at the last hearing to narrow the issues for Judge Foster. I, you know, when at the outset of this case, um, both sides were very clear there were terabytes and terabytes of information uh, that are up in some cloud. And I don't, I did not want Judge Foster to look at terabytes and terabytes of information. I want him to look at the information that will help um, this court make a decision on the motions that were filed. Um, so let, let me ask you this, Mr. Dresser. What do you have to say? Like, I initially thought it was to have you agree uh, to the 60 emails for Judge Foster to look at. I was. I was put in a scenario where it did appear he thought he was supposed to be looking at them. I think what he was supposed to be looking at is the attachments with the corresponding emails to those attachments. But I, I figured he was a special master, not making the ultimate ruling, not going to share these with anybody else. So my client authorized me to give all of the emails unredacted to Judge Foster's review. And remember, and I'm not, I'll, I'll, I'll move on from my historical gripe with this case, but I will say, Many times, up until now, they have suggested that the 67 emails that they've never seen, they're privileged. They're communications directly between me and my client and back and forth. And now, well, maybe they're not privileged. Maybe they're just scheduled. The state just keeps moving the, the goalposts. And they're saying, you know, you need to review them to determine the weight of the prejudice. They're, it's prejudice. They have my communications. Everyone had them. They were accessed or they had access to them. That's not even in dispute. Ms. Butler had access to them. Uh, everyone that was on NextPoint had access to them. They were all on NextPoint. And then it's just the two documents that they claim they have. I don't think, once you review Judge Foster's order, which perhaps we should hold this ruling until, I'm not exactly sure what it's gonna look like. I assume it's going to be a, a privilege law. It's gonna say this date, this time, this email, privileged. This date, this time, email, privileged. Not privileged, whatever he finds. And then, at that point, it may be very obvious to you whether you can or can't make the determinations in this ruling. I, I see no reason with that information alone that you would not be able to make a ruling. What I was what I was really looking for and hopeful is that Judge Foster would, would review. He would determine if it's privileged, not privileged. Then I would be able to look at the metadata that is the privileged and not privileged. Then I would be able to look at the metadata that is whether the state of Florida access certain files, whether the state of Florida anyone access those files. If the state of Florida didn't, um, prejudice to me doesn't really matter all that much, but you're saying it does. Well, I, I agree it, it doesn't matter as much. That, that it's totally clear that if we didn't see it, obviously prejudice doesn't matter as much. But when you go through defense motions, it does. Because they're alleging it doesn't matter if they saw it or not. Their motions say- it's, You're just saying this to people, that it got uploaded to the cloud. because we uploaded it to the cloud, I think at that point, the nature of it, the court can make two rules. One, the state never saw it, therefore there's no prejudice. Two, even if they did see it and mishandle it and it was up in the cloud, that it is de minimis and non-prejudicial. Okay. And there are two elements, though, that the court is going to be faced with. There is a case law that suggests what the standard is to dismiss just the ASA or ASA's handling the case. So the court saying, well, Ms. Stifler was in, in possession of this. Emails went to Ms. Stifler. I'm going to remove Ms. Stifler and anybody that she worked with or you know shared that information at the time, but I'm not going to re remove the entire office. That's one finding the court's going to have to make. The second layer is whether we dismiss the entire court judicial circuit and assign a new prosecutor depending on how widespread that is. So I agree with the state that you have to know about access and what each person received, but it's a little bit more uh, fine-tuned than that because there's kind of two inquiries for the case. Anymore. Okay. Thank you. Let me talk to you, Mr. Cody. On the Gardner case, I had um, a different set of questions. Yes, or when I reviewed and then amended the request for the special master um, to review, to me, your motion exposed more. Um, and in my remember, the way I remember it is that there were 
devices. There was a Google Cloud, there's an iCloud. There are Google devices, there are iPhones that were then search warrants were served on that, not given to the taint, um, not given to the taint team. And then there was an email from one of the officers to Ms. Kipler, I believe, asking whether this was like attorney client privilege. Is that correct? There were multiple <coughs> multiple communications with Ms. Stifler about whether or not things were were attorney client privilege. And my, and my understanding is that whatever this, what was served on the search warrant was then uploaded to some cloud, okay, and then that information was divided out among law enforcement, not the taint team, not the taint agent, I should say, and they were going to go through it. So is that what? So a little bit different. So you have you have next point over here, which was the first issue brought to the court's attention, where. The, what I would call the unredacted or the information that had not gone through the Taint team was uploaded and accessible. Separately, in February of 2023, after the agreement uh, was agreed upon by all parties, the state went out and executed search warrants on Google and Apple for cloud data associated with the accounts that were linked to those devices. Those returns were then given to law enforcement who began reviewing them without, the taint. without any involvement of the Tate agent. And, and the one that, well, we know that they were both reviewed. Uh, the one that we find to be most egregious is they took her text messages, her iCloud text messages, so her iMessages that come in the form of an Excel spreadsheet and the law enforcement team emailed them around, divided them up and said, start reviewing. Um, How many emails was this? How many text messages? Yeah, the text messages, whatever this is. Hundreds about. of thousands. Okay, and you're claiming that would be a term of kind of privilege? There, or some of them. Some of them are, um, and we know that some attorney, at least messages between uh, Ms. Gardner and her attorneys were reviewed by the law enforcement team. And there was also some kind of call between your client and Hank Cox, is that right? Yeah, there was a recorded phone call. Where did that come from? So we found that on on uh, the data from my client's iCloud, and and that was something that we found. And we do not have any information based on the depositions that that was reviewed by a member of the law enforcement team. Um, but I'll be honest with your honor, we are still finding more attorney-client communications up to this day. I mean, there's just as we discussed, there are terabytes and terabytes. There are hundreds of thousands of of messages, we've been sorting them. Not all of them are can be clearly identified by phone numbers and things of that. What nature. did you give Judge Foster? We gave Judge Foster those call that call, um, some text messages and some emails um, that we uh, were identified between Miss Gardner and her attorneys. I do want to you know tell the court that the access issue is only part of our motion. The gravamen of our motion is. Uh, what we would what we characterize in our motion is substantial misconduct and that would be the actions by the prosecution team and we believe that includes the state attorney's office it includes the ATF it includes the Jacksonville Beach Police Department that they you know there was this agreement and then they all willfully and intentionally sort of disregard it and start going through materials that they knew uh, were carbon copies of the phones that they were told they were not allowed to touch. And so that is the gravamen of our motion and why we're asking for dismissal, uh, because we think that it's outrageous. We think that it was willful. We think that it was intentional. Um, and we think that everyone knew it was going on and, and was okay with it. Uh, and that, that's not right. I mean, the attorney-client privilege is uh, you know, one of the most sacred privileges in the court, and you can't just do an end around of an agreement to remove attorney client communications from data. And I do think, Your Honor, that the state's motion is premature because we don't know what Judge Foster is going to write. We don't know whether or not it's sufficient for the purposes of the motion. My problem is I don't know what the state's motion is. So you're t are you telling me that you haven't, you still haven't identified all of what you need Judge Foster to review? No, Your Honor, because I, I accept the state attorney's position that they did not review any of the attorney-client communications that 
that were uploaded to next one. I, I, at least the prosecutors. I, I, I accept their word to the court. There's a lot of back and forth about this taint team. It's great that both sides have agreed that the prosecutor's office has not seen these privileged documents. Maybe the Jacksonville Police Department has, but I think that the whole idea of this it's basically they know there's some information in these text messages from Shanna and they want to try to prevent them from getting any evidence. They know there's something really incriminating between Shanna and her lawyers. So I find that pretty interesting. Now, do I know what the Jacksonville Beach Police Department reviewed? No. I know what the ATF, your ATF analyst reviewed because she told us. Um, but I don't know what the other ATF agents reviewed or what the Jacksonville Beach Police Department reviewed as we sit here right now. But I also don't know that I've identified all of the attorney-client communications because there is so much data. And some of those communications cannot be sorted by emails or phone numbers. We are finding them as we go along, line by line, file by file. Okay. But I do agree with the court that you know, if the state um, did not access them, then you know, that's a different issue. That, that prejudice may not be important for that. Our motion though is primarily based on at this time, the conduct by the state and its law enforcement team, which I believe the case law establishes, they are all the state, especially when this was an active investigation involving the state attorney's office from day one. And so the state, what I believe in the prior hearings has tried to do is say, well, that's them. We're not responsible for what the police do we're separate from them, and I don't think that's what the case law says. And actually, I think the facts of this case will show that they were actively involved at every step and aware that law enforcement was going out and getting the iCloud and going out and getting the, the Google return. What's your position on uh, Judge Foster making the ultimate decision? Judge, since our uh, motion primarily rests on the substantial misconduct, uh, we believe that Your Honor is the appropriate person to, to make the ruling on the motion. We don't believe um, that uh, Judge Foster, one, has the authority to do it, and then two, would be in the best position to do it. Okay. Is there anything you want to add, Mr. Rosario? I'm not going to respond to the entire argument that was made with regard to the ultimate decision in this case, which is what I mostly heard there. Other than to say that's exactly why the court would be in an impossible position to rule. It's because of everything you just said. And so I thought thank him for supporting our argument, our position, that the court has to have the knowledge of what the defense is claiming was misconduct before making a decision uh, that they, the remedies that they've asked for. We have lots of responses to Judge, I don't think I, I said anything about the, necessarily the content of any of these communications being, uh, at least at this time, um, being known to the court in order for the court to rule. We're focused more on the court, on the state's actions than the content of any specific communication. And I don't believe the case law supports that the court needs that information to find substantial misconduct. Do you have an, an idea of what Judge Foster needs to review related to the Gardner case? I believe he has evidence. According to the defense, we don't have the information. According well, I mean, so the, the search warrant that was served on the, the Google, what is it called, Google? Go, they, they're served on Google Inc. for... Google Inc. and then the iCloud. Does Judge Foster have that from the state's perspective? He has the defense submitted to them as a potential attorney client privilege. That's what they represented to me. And you're saying you haven't submitted everything? I'm, you're still I, I'm saying there are still things that we are finding as of a week ago. But we, I, again, we've not gone back to Judge Foster and submitted them because they are not the center of our, our case. Just like Mr. Dreiser was talking about those 60 something emails, you know. We don't know that those are necessary as our position is simply that they went around the court ratified agreement to use a taint team and seized information and data that they knew had attorney client 
privileged communications on it. And once they got it, they didn't give it to the Tain agent and there are issues with the Tain team that I'm not gonna get into, but they didn't give it to the Tain agent that they just started reviewing it because they felt they could. And that is wrong. It was in violation of the court ordered agreement. The prosecutor's office knew that they were getting that data. And when they went to the second, you know, again, I don't wanna argue with you on, I think it's laid out in our motion, but we are focused more on the process that the state used and what the, in their conduct than we are in this, any specific communication. And unlike Mr. Fernandez, the state has not told us that they have anything that they intend to use against Ms. Gardner that they should not have had gotten their hands on. Um, you know, I, I think in Mr. Fernandez's case, I think the fact that they were gonna use it as evidence is de facto prejudice because they've admitted that it's probative. They don't have anything in our case that they've said they've gotten their hands on that they're gonna use. So we're in a little bit different posture. Okay. All right, I'm gonna wrap this up then. I'm gonna take it under advisement and issue an order, okay? Yes, Your Honor. Do you all have another date with Judge Foster? Yeah. No. Yeah. He was gonna let us know when he was ready. I, I thought reading tea leaves, it, it was like an April 8th date, and I think he's probably using that as a little longer from what I gather he said. I gave that just so that these cases don't fall off. Um, I'll just keep it on the April 8th date and I'll issue an order on the state's um, motion to clarify. Okay. Yes, Your Honor. Right. Thank, Thank you, you all you. very much. It really seems like all this back and forth about which judge will review it or any of this back and forth about the prosecutor's offices to kind of slow this trial down. So I think Judge Kite will make a good ruling or, or Judge um, Foster will make the right ruling as well about these privileged documents and hopefully we can move this trial along.